Hey there, Sam. API or application programming interface is a scary word for a very simple concept. The word interface here has a huge weight in the meaning of API. Let's explain API starting with the word interface. So what is an interface? An interface is a point of interaction or a tool for us to work with a much more complicated system. For example, a computer is a very complicated system for us average human to understand. However, in order for us to work with a computer, we don't really need to understand the inner working of a computer. That would be too much to learn. Instead, all we need to know is to learn how to use the keyboard and mouse for us to interact with the computer. The keyboard and the mouse are relatively simple compared to the computer system. And that is exactly what an interface is. A simple tool to work with or interact with a much more complicated system. Let's take a look at another example, a car. Similar to a computer, a car is also very complicated for us average human to understand. So to make our life easier, the car manufacturer has made available a few interfaces for us to drive a car. For example, a steering wheel, a gearbox, the indicator handle, and a speed pedal. With these interfaces, we can interact with a car without knowing the inner working of a car. Now, API is exactly like these interfaces. The only difference is, an API is an interface to a computer software. So if a software has an API, we don't really need to know the inner working of the software, but only need to learn the API provided for us to interact with the software. In other words, API are just a set of functions provided by a software for us to interact with it. Generally, there are two types of API, programming API and web API. Let's take a look at a few examples to make this concrete. So programming API is just really a set of functions that we can use directly in our programming language. I'll show you what I meant. The browser is a large piece of software that has lots of components in it. Just name a few examples. We have the console, the DOM, and the local storage. We can think of each of these individual components as separate software. And the browser does offer us ways to interact with these components. In other words, the browser offers us a programming API for us to interact with these components and we have seen it lots of times already. For example, to work with the console, we simply just need to call the console functions. Console.log or console.error are functions that we can call on the console object. In other words, the API of the console. To interact with the DOM, again, we are calling functions from the document object. And again, all the functions that are exposed by the document object are the API of the DOM. And we're using these APIs directly in JavaScript. That's why it's called the programming API. If you want to take a look at all the available APIs offered to you by the browser, you can go to the web API documentation and check out all these APIs available to us. The link is in the description. There are lots of interesting APIs here. For example, the Bluetooth API, where we can let the browser to interact with Bluetooth on our device. Imagine you can remote control a toy car using a browser. How cool is that? The geolocation API is another interesting one where we can get to know the location of our website visitor. So applications like Google Map or Uber will have relied on this API to get to know the user's location. That's enough for programming API. Let's move on to web API. Have you been to some website where you can share some posts directly to your Twitter account or your Facebook account or a website that has Google Map embedded in it? They are not owned by Google, Facebook or Twitter but yet they are using these third-party services on their website. And if you're wondering how they did this, it is through the magic of web API. There are millions of web applications out there and the majority of them are closed source. That means their source code is not open to the public, which means we can't interact with them directly in our programming language. And therefore there's no programming API available to us. So what should we do then? There are typically two ways for us to interact with a web app. The first way, which is obvious, is to use the user interface provided by the website. The second way is to use Web API. As we mentioned earlier, APIs are essentially functions exposed by a software. In contrast to programming API, where we run these functions directly in our programming language, for Web API, we'll be running these functions through HTTP. Before we dive in any deeper, let's first look at what is HTTP and how it works. HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And again, it's a scary word for a very simple concept. We humans has lots of ways to communicate with each other. When we want to talk to our friends, we can either call them by phone or send an email or text them. And similar to humans, computer can talk to each other by different ways as well. 
and HTTP is just one of the ways. The other methods include SSH, FTP, and Git, and many others. Each of these communication methods involves different rules and procedures. Just like how when we make a phone call, we gotta use a phone and dial the other person's number. Or when we text someone, we need to type our message out. Now let's go through HTTP in more details. Suppose this is your computer that you're using right now. And this is a server that sits somewhere in the internet. And now suppose your local machine wants to talk to the server via HTTP. The HTTP rules says that your local machine will send out a request to the server and the server will reply with exactly one response. So with one request, we're expecting to get back one response. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, for both request and response, each of them has two components, the header and the body. The header contains metadata about the HTTP request or response. For example, the content type or the language or the origin of the request or response. If this doesn't make sense to you, don't worry. We'll go through a real life example later. The body contains the payload. For example, if I was to log into a website, my request body will contain the credentials and the response body will be a message telling me if my login attempt is successful or not. HTTP request has different types of methods or flavors if you like to accommodate different types of operations. The most common methods are get, post, patch, and delete. The method is typically specified in the header of the request. A get request is generally for downloading, reading, or viewing resources. For example, downloading a HTML document to render in a browser or getting an array of users' Facebook posts. Post request is for creating new resources or for any miscellaneous operations. For example, creating a new user account or a new Facebook post or simply log in to a web application. A patch request is for updating resources. For example, when we want to update our Facebook post or a comment or our profile picture. A delete request is self-explanatory. Whenever we want to delete resources, we'll just send a delete request. Now let's take a look on how HTTP works in action. We'll go to Google with the Chrome developer tools open and we will switch to the network tab. This is where we can investigate all the HTTP requests happening inside the browser. Make sure you selected the all filter to view all the HTTP requests. There are other types of filters available to us to filter out different types of HTTP resources. Now that you'll notice there's a list of resources going on here. These are the HTTP requests that have been sent by the browser since the page was first loaded in chronological order. We can click on each individual item to investigate the request in more details. Let's go with the first one. The headers tabs here tells us more about the headers in our request and response. So if we scroll down a little bit more, we'll actually see what's inside our response header and also our request header. You'll see a lot of scary stuff here, but don't worry, you do not need to learn all of them at once. We just need to know a few of them in order to understand HTTP in general. So under the request headers, we have methods. It's a GET request, which means the current request that we're investigating at the moment is a GET request. And remember, a GET request is for downloading, reading, or viewing data. So in this case, if we go to the response tab, we see a HTML document. That means we're downloading a HTML document from Google's server. And if we go to the preview tab, we will see the rendered version of the response. So Chrome will render the HTML document right inside the developer tool. But you'll notice this is a little bit different to the one that we're seeing in the browser now. The Google's logo is missing. The icon is missing. Why is that? The reason is at the time when this HTML document is downloaded, we only have an image tag inside the document that's pointing to an external image file somewhere in the internet. So at the time when the browser tries to render this page and when it sees this image tag, it will then send another GET request to grab this image file. And once this GET request for the image file is completed, then the browser will put this image inside the DOM. The same applies to all the JavaScript files, CSS files, and so on and so forth. And that's the reason why we're seeing all these resources loaded inside this list. The first item is always the main page. And a subsequent request are the items that is required by the main page or sent out by the JavaScript file of the website. So if we try to click on the other request, we'll see my account avatars, the Google's logo, and lots of icons. And again, all these requests are fired by the main page. And they're all GET requests because we're just downloading files or resources from another server. Let's take a look at another example. 
We'll go to this website, codepen.io, and I'll try to log in with some garbage credentials. Now notice very carefully at the request list as I hit the login button. A new request has been added. Let's take a look at it. First of all, it's a post request rather than a get request because right now, we're no longer trying to download something from the server. We're trying to perform an action. And remember, post request is for creating new content or any other miscellaneous operations like login. And if we scroll to the very bottom, we can actually see the payload of our post request. These are the body of this post request sent to the codepen.io server. And they matches with what I entered in a text input of the website. If we go to the response, we're now seeing a JSON response rather than a HTML document. Let's go to the preview tab to look at the pretty printed JSON string. So this is what the server has sent us back when we entered a garbage credentials. It tells us the username and password is incorrect. And notice that the error message is exactly the same as what we see in the user interface here. Okay, let's break the whole process down and go through this together. So here's the server, and it has lots of predefined URLs that are listening to incoming HTTP requests. Each of them has their own roles and responsibilities. Sending a HTTP request to each of these routes will trigger a function in the server to perform some sort of task. And when the task is finished, the server will send back a response to the browser. Can you see where this is going now? We can let the user to run a certain functions on the server without even letting them to look at the code. This is exactly how a web API works. We are running functions on the server by sending a HTTP request to a certain URL or endpoint, and the server will send us back the result of the function. One thing to note here is that different HTTP methods could have different behavior on a certain endpoint. For that, you'll need to consult the documentation provided by the application's developer. For example, if we send a GET request to the login endpoint, the server might run a function that will return us a HTML document back. However, if we send a POST request to the login endpoint, the server will trigger a different function this time. It might take a look at the request body for the credentials, look up in its database, and try to find the matching credentials. If it found one, then the user is authenticated. Otherwise, the server will throw us back an error in JSON format. All of this behavior of the endpoints are all predefined by the author of the application. So if we want to use a web API provided by an application, the first thing to do is to read through the documentation and go through all the endpoints and see what they can do. Let's take a look at an example now. We'll be looking at GitHub's API. Going through the documentation here, we can get a list of open source licenses from the API. As we can see here, it's a GET request. I'll just copy the link here and paste it inside the browser's URL bar. By default, the browser will perform a GET request on the URL that we entered in the URL bar. And now we're seeing a JSON string returned back by the API endpoint, which is an array of licenses. If you're using the Chrome browser, you might not be seeing this pretty printed JSON string out of the box. I'm using this extension called JSON Formatter to do the job for me. The link is in the description if you're interested. Now, there's one last thing I want to go through before we end the lesson, which is the concept of HTTP codes. You might have already noticed this already. Whenever we send a request to a server, there is this thing called the status code being returned back in the response header. The status code is also known as the HTTP codes. And as a convention, we normally use these codes to indicate whether a HTTP request is successful or not. If you go to this website, you can take a look at all the standard HTTP codes that are used in the internet today. Just a quick overview. The 200 series normally means success without any errors. The 300 series normally means redirection, where the server wants to send us to a different web page. For example, after we logged in, the server might want to send us to the app dashboard. And in that case, the server will return us a status code of 302. The 400 series normally means there's an error within our request. It could be our endpoint is misspelled, or the payload is incorrect, or we are unauthenticated. The 500 series means there's a bug on the server side, and there's usually nothing we can do when we see this error, other than contacting the site's owner. I hope it makes sense so far. We'll be building a very simple app in the next lesson using Web API and JavaScript. I'll see you there. Key takeaway for this lesson, APIs are just functions exposed by a software, while we can use the API to interact with the software. Programming API are consumed within the programming language itself. We call the functions directly inside the code. In contrast, Web API are consumed via HTTP, where we don't have access to the source code of the software by using HTTP requests to trigger functions of the software. HTTP comes with two parts, 
the request and the response. The browser will send a request to the server, and the server would reply back with a response. And both of the request and response would have a header and a body. The header contains metadata about the request or response, while the body contains the payload. If you enjoyed the content of this video, don't forget to hit the like, subscribe, and the bell icon for more content to come. It will really help me out. Thanks for your support.